What is the meaning of life? Who created us and why? I'm here today very curious to learn about Christianity and the message that Christianity brings to people. Hi, how are Hi. you doing? I'm Michael. Michael, pleasure to meet you. Rabbi Schwartz, Alan Schwartz. Hi. That's why this building is facing west. Hmm? Mayans believe that Thunderbolt God has some hatches. In addition, every little village had its own gods. The local stream, an especially big tree, an oddly shaped rock, all were thought to have their own god inside them. The ancient Egyptians had a strong belief that the soul comes back to the body after uh, uh, some time of his death. Uh, so there it is mentioned that 33 crore, like 330 million dummy gods. Wow. <laughs> it's a huge number, but it's a huge universe to maintain. <laughs> Here, all these people are the same. No poor people, no rich people. All right. Yes, uh, we are live now. Uh, Salam alaikum, brother. How are you? Yeah, I, yeah thank you very much. Uh, and yes, uh, we would like to talk about uh, the shaitan and um, economic uh, uh, was um, oppression. Yes, oppression exactly. So uh, I would like to um, see. Uh, let me see if there are people. On chat, uh, those who are who see us, please uh, write to us. Uh, chat uh, because is uh, all right. Uh, we can wait a little bit to see. Maybe people uh, will join us. Okay, and then we can start. Uh, so far, I don't see <clears throat> because we, we have two more two minutes as well left. Okay. I started a little bit earlier for to mm -hmm. check. <clears throat> so how are you, inshallah, brother? Doing good. Doing really good. Alhamdulillah. How's the weather there? Where, which city you are living, by the way? Well, right now I'm in the Philadelphia area. Philadelphia. All right. In Philadelphia, New Jersey. New Jersey. New Jersey, Philadelphia area. Okay. I've been to Philadelphia and New Jersey. Okay. And how is the weather there now? It's actually getting nice. You know, we're entering the spring. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, it's um, in Sweden, Stockholm. It's not that warm yet, but uh, it's around 12 degrees uh, Celsius. I don't know if you are familiar with Celsius. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, I'm, use, we, we use Fahrenheit, but I mean, I learned Celsius in school. I know like zero is freezing in Celsius, 32 in Fahrenheit. A hundred is boiling in Celsius, two hundred and twelve in Fahrenheit. Yeah. yeah, it's difficult for me. Uh, Fahrenheit is difficult, but Celsius, I I understand, of course. Right. All right. Uh, yeah. Okay. We, we can start. Uh, maybe you can start, brother. Uh, you have prepared something. Okay. Subject. Well, today's presentation of Satan and economic oppression. Uh, was taken actually as a spin-off of a previous lecture you did, Who is Satan? And we wanted to specify more, to, to have people focus more on the economic perspective. And of course, you were presenting the uh, concept that uh, Satan is economic. Economic oppression is Satan, of which probably a lot of people may agree, or they would at least agree that it's Satanic. The, the system that rules over is at least Satanic in its... Um, application uh so we want to have we're gonna have a, a, a try to have approximately a one hour discussion uh, broken into three 20 minute segments the first will be economics from a theological perspective and we'll just go over i will try to introduce some scriptures that support your your assertion or your uh, thesis concerning e economics in relation to satan uh, then we'll go into another 20 minutes about economics in the modern day world in which we'll just discuss some of the economic obstacles and struggles that people are dealing with and um, how the world is viewing economics in different parts of the world. And then finally, we'll focus on forming strategies, ideas, and expectations for economic uh, equality. So I wanted to go back into the uh, spiritual route. Now, a lot of people, of course, they either have, they want to neglect the scriptures and just look at it from a secular perspective 
I try to reconcile both together, you know, be in the reality of the world of what's going on in the world at the same time, be able to equate that with scriptures. So in the scriptures, we go back to the garden of Eden and that was considered, of course, in the Bible and the Quran, it's, it, it was a labor free paradise because we know that God, Allah created everything in perfect balance. The, um, the garden was perfection. It was, it was paradise. And that's why even Muslims refer to heaven as Jannah, but Jannah literally means the garden. And even in, and the garden in the Bible was referred to as a self watered garden, meaning that it produced from its own self. And the Quran also says that the believers will inherit gardens with rivers that flow beneath, which again is the same concept of the self watered garden. So in the garden, in the Quranic concept and the Bible, Satan was in the garden. Uh, in the Quran, he's identified as a jinn who deceived Adam and Eve. And as a consequence for their rebellion, they were expelled from this paradise. And the Bible goes on to explain that uh, one of the punishments for man was now that he would have to work hard, hard labor in order to produce the fruits which he didn't have to do in the garden. And that began the process where men now, because we were all faced with this curse of labor, hard labor, some decided to deceive others into doing their share of work or to enslave others by force. So that becomes a spiritual route there from the garden of, um, of slavery. And then we go into um, the next phase with Moses, the children of Israel. And once again, the journey of the children of Israel begins with the enslavement in Egypt. So we're looking at slavery again. And in Egypt, um, it's interesting that the Quran and the Bible both mention a character. The Bible refers to him as Kura. The Quran, the Quran is in Karun. And the Quran says in, um, in Surah 2876, surely Qurun was of the people of Moses, but he rebelled against them. And we've given him of the treasures so much that his hordes of wealth would certainly weigh down a company of men possessed of great strength. So here was Korah, who was actually among the children of Israel, but he had such wealth that it says a, a company of strong men would have difficulty in lifting his treasures. And he became the main opposition to Moses. Now, Moses was also raised in wealth because he was raised in the Pharaoh's palace, but he was able to detach himself from that in order to serve God's purpose. Korah used his wealth to become an opposition to God's purpose. So we have Korah here as a, aligning himself with the Pharaoh, and if Korah had his way, of course, what would have happened? The children of Israel would have remained in slavery. But thank goodness they had Musa, and Allah had given Musa the direction uh, to uh, liberate the Israelites from slavery. So we're going back to the same concept again. And the final concept in regards to Moses and the children of Israel was the Sabbath. Now, Jesus says the Sabbath was created for man, not man, not man for the Sabbath. So what it means is that the Sabbath was given as a day of rest because we know in slavery, the greedy slave master, he doesn't want to give anybody rest. And we have that today. People are being worked, just be, even children are being worked to death or being worked in, in labor camps. And um, But what it says in Deuteronomy 5.15 is, remember that you were slaves in Egypt and the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath. So once again, we can see the Sabbath as a, a solution or a day of rest in opposition to slavery. Because he's saying, when I bought you out of Egypt, that's why you will keep the Sabbath. Now, because the, the slave masters weren't going to give you a Sabbath. They're going to give you a minute of rest. So that, that pretty much shows the, the correlation between enslavement that there's a there is an economic aspect there with starting with satan and then going we see that with moses and the pharaoh and then we go on to jesus now in jesus time the early christians were known as ebionites 
And the Ebionites, the word Ebionite comes from the Hebrew Ebion, which means the poor ones. They called themselves the poor ones. Now, the reason they did that, they were living in a, in a monastery kind of setting in a communal existence. And in that setting, you had to, um, if, if you had wealth, basically you distributed among the, the people there, among the poor. And in that regard, there's a, there's a verse in, in the Bible, Matthew 19, 21, there was a wealthy young man who spotted Jesus and his followers, and he was attracted to it. And he wanted to join. And Jesus said to him, first sell your wealth and di distribute to the poor, and then you can come follow me. And it says at that point, he became very sad because he didn't. Now, this is a person who's talking to the Messiah face to face, and he's telling him, all you have to do is just sell your wealth so we can get on with the ministry and we can get on with God's work. And he didn't want to do it. And um, he says here, Jesus, if you want to be perfect, sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. And the reason he was sad was his heart was attached to this materialism. And that brings us to another verse here. It says, store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So his heart was tied into this materialism and treasure. And that's what we're seeing now. Their hearts are bound to this. So they're ready, they're ready to sacrifice for this. That's like a God for them. And even though this guy, like I said, was face to face with the Messiah, his heart was entangled into these treasures and he just couldn't do it. He wanted to do it. He saw, even though he saw there was something in Jesus and he saw the followers and he liked the concepts. But when it came down to that wealth, that's where he had to cut off. And that comes to another prominent verse here where Jesus says, again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. So you're talking about a camel and an eye of a needle. You understand that ratio. He's saying it's, it's very, because that shows you how much wealth can be a stumbling block. It doesn't have to be. We've seen people like Moses and others who were able to have wealth and dedicate it to the cause of God. But we also were seeing that in many cases, it's going to become a very hard stumbling block. So then, then also in Matthew, another verse, he, Jesus says, no one can serve two masters. You cannot serve God and money. That's in Matthew 6, 24. So there it goes again, God versus money. And one of the reasons we're comparing God and money now is in today's secular, quote unquote, modern world, many people who've become atheists or, or just part of the secular system, they believe they've outgrown God, but they've also outgrown the idols. You're not going to see too many people worshiping Jupiter or Dagon or any of these old idols of the past, but what they are worshiping is money because the money has become their God. So that's why Jesus says in here on 624, you can't serve two masters. You can't serve God and money. And the final one, which I think is probably would be a verse that really supports your thesis that we could probably really use is it says here, first Matthew, first Timothy 610, the love of money is the root of all evil. So yeah. there you go, right there. So if you wanted to even discuss it with a Christian and saying, well, the economics can't be Satan. Well, you say, well, who's the root of all evil? Then he would probably say Satan. And then you'd say, well, your Bible's telling you right there that Satan, that money is the root of all evil. So money's the root of all evil. Satan is the root of all evil. So there you have your, yeah, there's your, that's your, that's your home run verse right there that brings it all into what you were saying. Now I just want to go into these two last final phases. Um, the the Ebionites and Muhammad, the Prophet Muhammad, the, the history of the Ebionites continues in Arabia and during the time of the Prophet Muhammad. It's believed that his wife Khadija and her cousin Waraka were Ebionites. Waraka was an Ebionite priest. It says he used to um, write the scriptures in Hebrew. And Waraka and Khadija were the two witnesses. They were the ones who witnessed that the Prophet Muhammad was having revelations of the Holy Spirit in the cave of uh, Hira, and they were, um, so, but Khadija, the interesting thing about Khadija as an Ebionite, she was a very successful and wealthy 
businesswoman. Yeah. But what she decided, what she did was she used her as the as with the Ebionite tradition, she used her wealth to finance the prophet's dawah mission, his outreach, his ministry, as she probably was doing already for her um, her cousin Waraka, who was a priest. And again, they both accepted. And also, the uh, just a another point was there is another Ebionite priest. His name was Bahira. He was the one who actually foretold that the when he saw a young prophet Muhammad at around the age of 12, that he would one day become a prophet. So again, we have another example here of Khadija, who's acting just as Moses. She was able to separate from her wealth or she was able to direct it in the right way because her heart wasn't in the wrong place. She could have used that money for herself or she could have used it to try to control the prophet. I'm going to just make him dependent on me and, there's a lot of things she could have done, but she didn't go that route. She chose the godly route. And um, interesting, interesting here. Here's a very interesting verse from the Quran, Surah 381. Allah has certainly heard the saying of those who say, surely Allah is poor and we are rich. I will record what they say, and they're killing the prophets unjustly. And I will say, taste the chastisement of the fire. So here, here they are again. They were saying... Why were they saying Allah is poor? Because they were looking at the people of God as being poor because they were not living for riches and wealth. And just, just like it was saying about Karun in the time of Moses, there was a saying in the Quran about Karun. It says at that time, there was a saying among the children of Israel. They would, they would say, if we only could live the life of Harun. So Harun, it was the envy of every, everybody wanted that wealth. They wanted that. And it's saying just like here, People, why would basically the, the non-believers saying, why would you follow Allah when you're not going to be rich? We have the wealth. If you're going to, you know, why would you want to be like them? And a lot of Christians follow that kind of concept. They have what they call the prosperity ministry now. So they're saying if you're if you're blessed and you have all this money, that shows God is with you because you have these millions of dollars. And, you know, so it's all a twisted form of money worship and devaluing the qualities of God. And now I want to get into the um, the final phase of my presentation in regards to a, a theological perspective on um, economic oppression, the caliphate, and this will lead this will lead right into what you were discussing about the Mahdi and how he will establish a um, a just kingdom of uh, righteousness in regards to econo economics. During the time of the caliphate and Uthman, when Uthman be became the caliph, there was a man named Abu Dar Ghaffari. And Abu Dhar Ghaffari is considered to be one of the closest companions of Ali. And it says here, in fact, Imam al-Bakir states that Abu Dhar Ghaffari was counted among the three most trusted companions who remained loyal to Ali after the passing of the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, the other two were Salman Farsi and Mikdad ibn Aswad. So Abu Dhar Ghaffari was very a very strong advocate for the poor people, again. And Uthman was, again, the wealthy aristocrat, and they had a very strong um, debate over what they call the Bait Ma'al. Bait Ma'al is the, the treasury. And I guess it would translate as the house of treasury, which today would be the bank. So the um, in the bank, they were um, Abu Ghaffar was very clear that that funds should be directed to the poor people. <clears throat> That's what, I mean, he made it very, that was his position. And Udman was like, no, no, it belongs to the government, the governing authorities, and we distribute it as we see fit. And that was a precursor to the ultimate, that was another dimension. There was also, the, of course, the hereditary battle between Ali and Muwaya, Muya and Udman and all that. But there was also the economic battle. And Abu Ghaffari, of course, I said, who was with Ali later. And of course, all these events in this economic struggle led to the assassination of Uthman because the people were, and, and, and of course we see today, some people, some people drag um, you know, Abdul ibn Saba into this and he was supposed to have, according to the Sunni doctrine, Ab ibn Saba was the instigator and he was the bad Jew. And so, but somehow he duped Ghaffari to following him even though Ghaffari is so prominent. So Ibn Salba was supposed to, I mean, to be a champion of the poor people. And here he is siding with Ghaffari against 
Another Jew, Kabo Akbar, uh, who, who was also a wealthy aristocrat who was, who was with Utman. So there was a, a, a very split over this economics and it all led to the assassination of Utman. Uh, supposedly in the assassination, uh, um, Abu Bakr's son was there, Muhammad. He, he supposedly was restrained at the last moment. He planned to assassinate him. He didn't do it because of Abdul Ibn Salam, who was a, who, who convinced him not to do that. And, but he did wind up getting assassinated, Uthman. And then they wound up blaming Ali. They didn't blame Ali directly for the assassination, but they said Ali was protecting those people. He wasn't taking enough action. He wasn't taking the, the action to rectify this. And it wasn't that he wasn't taking the action. It was that he was in favor of the poor masses. And the poor masses were, they're the ones that rose up on Uthman under the guidance of Abu Ghaffari. So there was another struggle right there in the, uh, for the caliphate. And um, so just in summary, we have people that are worshiping um, money and they can't let it go. They won't let it go. And just like the Pharaoh wouldn't let go, they're determined to hold on to their power. And then we have people who were able to, Moses was an example, Khadijah, the prophet Muhammad. Uh, there's another character, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a wealthy follower of Jesus. And he was in the council and he, su he supported Jesus and he used his wealth to back Jesus up. So we, that pretty much is a summary of the, uh, the spiritual uh, dimensions of this. And I think that will take us to, from the caliphate is an ideal time for you to come in and talk about the Mahdi and how the Mahdi will um, rectify this whole uh, dilemma and bring about a kingdom of uh, justice in, the, in terms of economics. Yes. Thank you, brother um, Imam Misak. And uh, I would like to, yes, to talk about, uh, first of all, uh, to talk about uh, <clears throat> the, there is a verse of Quran, uh, Quran chapter 8, verse 7 and 8. Allah says, yeah. One second, one second. I just wanted to just check for a technical thing or on the video because somebody was saying from the outside they can't see me on the video. So I don't know. Are we having any technical difficulties or is everything I running? See, I see you, uh, um, but is it on Quran. Facebook? I see you on Facebook. Uh, I've, of course, uh, on YouTube there was some problem. I don't know, uh, but on Facebook, uh, this is uh, this is from Facebook. Okay, so you are good. Okay, that's good. I was they, they probably just aren't getting through the right. Uh... I, I don't know. Uh, okay. I, see, I see some people also. They are uh, watching. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Yes. Uh, this uh, Quran, uh, chapter 8, verse 7 and 8 says that Allah says, But Allah intended, intended to establish the truth by his words and to eliminate the kuffar, that he should establish the truth and abolish, abolish the falsehood, even if the criminals dislike it. So uh, it says to us that one day he's going to establish Establish the truth. The establish the uh, what, uh, get abolish the 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 falsehood. So it means that abolish means that totally, not partly. Okay, when Allah so when Allah want to do something, so He has to do it perfectly, not just you know to uh, abolish some falsehood, some and then to establish uh, some truth. No, He's going to establish it. Uh, uh, the absolute justice and truth. Mm -hmm. So that's why uh, uh, um, I say that um, to my fellow Muslims also that one day, if and then if Shaitan is the root of all bad deeds, uh, according Quran and all Abrahamic religion, it was it is Shaitan who uh, you know who uh, guide us to bad deeds. Uh, Quran says that uh, uh, Shaitan spread poverty among you and lead you to immorality. Okay, so it is Shaitan who guides us to morality, and then Allah guides you to to morality. Shaitan guides you to darkness. Allah guides you to light. So, so everything is Shaitan. Shaitan is fooling us. Now, if he's going to establish the the truth, establish uh, I mean, abolish the falsehood, then it, it means that he has to get rid of the source. Okay, which is uh, Shaitan. 
and he says in Quran as well uh, that uh, sorry uh, I just have to again check this uh, Facebook event I don't know why okay yes um, he says in Quran when when they are talking uh, Shaitan and uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they are talking. Uh, Shaitan asked him to give me time until Riyama so that I can fool uh, humanity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, yes, you have time, but until a certain day, a decided date. And waqt uh, al it says in Quran, until uh, a decided time. Some uh, fellow Muslims say, no, it is until Riyama. I say that if it was, then he wouldn't repeat. Okay, okay, you have time until Riyama. And this waqt al is different to, to what shaitan asked. Shaitan asked for the hour, or the, the, the resurrection time. Uh, I don't know the uh, right now uh, the exact word in Arabic, but anyway, it matches everything, okay? When you put the, the different pieces of puzzles together, then it matched this one that one day we get rid of, even with this one verse I, uh, I read for you, it matched that one day if it's going to be if it's just empty words, okay, just random words, then it cannot be random words. If it is real words, then as, uh, uh, you know, educated people, we understand so, establish means that 100%, God cannot do that 50%, 40%. My government in Sweden has done it 40, 50%. So God should do better. God should do 100%. So uh, that is it. So it is 100%. And when it is, is I say also like uh, to, to fellow Muslim that it's like a doctor who say you have cancer and you have pain everywhere in your body. And then doctor say, I have the cure. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the cure should get rid of the cancer. He cannot say that I have the cure, but you will live with the cancer entire life and you will have pain. <laughs> That's not the cure. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if Allah SWT says that he's going to establish the, the, the truth, and abolish the falsehood, so it means that to get rid of the source, totally, entirely. And he says there that, yes, you have time, but until a certain time, a decided time, okay? So this decide, he asked for 100, if you decide, we, we analyze it at zero to 100, okay? So zero was the time they were talking, 100 is Qiyama, the, the end of the time. So Shaitan asked, Give me time until 100. He said, you have time until a certain time. Okay, decide the time. So he didn't say, okay, until 100, until resurrection time. He said, you have time until a decided time. So if we just take this one as, for example, at 90, okay, 80 or 90, and tomorrow is 90, and uh, shaitan will disappear. So I say that, when we will wake up, everybody wake up, shaitan doesn't exist. So farmers of Afghanistan, which are, are producing 90% of the world opium, just because it gives them more money, okay, than potatoes and tomatoes, will they stop? No, they will not stop. Assad is bombing people because of money, because he want to be rich, he want to be powerful. Will he stop if shaitan doesn't exist? No, he will not stop. So as long as, I say that as long as this economic system that allows 1% of the total capital of the, uh, the total population of the planet, which are kind of 70 or 80 million people, they own 50% of the total capital of the planet, which is $110 trillion. And Allah SWT says in Quran that shaitan spread poverty among you and lead you to, to immorality. Okay. Mm -hmm. So who is spreading poverty among us? Is that 1%? who spread poverty among hundreds of millions of people who live on one dollar a day, okay? So I, think, I, I, now, I, think, I think at this time now, because we're going into that, that will lead us into the second segment right now, because if we're gonna talk, now we're gonna go into talking about economics in the world today, you know, past the scripture, so we, we, and it's, it's about the half hour mark, so we'll go now into the second segment of economics in the modern day world you can continue where you were where you were but we'll just start to talk about what's going on in the world today with this yes yes this, yeah this is what, what's going on exactly and i would say about uh, you know Mahdi as well that uh okay but uh, one more thing is that uh, i can say right away about Mahdi that the, the concept of Mahdi um i believe this i have to say it, uh, straight away that uh, 
I believe that this, this is just a message. Mahdi, uh, Jesus, coming of Jesus and uh, Messiah is just a message that there is a way out. Okay, one day we will get rid of all these problems, but it doesn't mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to send, uh, you know, somebody to save us. If he was going to do that, the, 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 I believe that the, the meaning of life uh, creation is that we do it. He guides us, he teaches us, and we do it. Otherwise, if he was, uh, if he, why he doesn't show himself to us, why he doesn't show a miracle every day so that these atheists and people uh, believe in him is because if he shows, people say, okay, that's the problem, go and fix it yourself. Okay, you are God, okay? But the, the, the reason that he doesn't show is that he wants that we do it ourselves, okay? Otherwise they say, okay, you are God, that's the problem, go and get rid of it, fix it for us. So he wants that we do it ourselves. That's why he gave us Quran. Otherwise he would uh, fix it himself. He wouldn't put us here. Right away he would uh, destroy shaitan and keep us in, in heaven. He wouldn't put us here at all. He put us here so that by his guidance, ah, that's, uh, that's why he gave us also this ability to understand. So that yeah. when he read Quran, so we understand it, okay? Uh, and uh, by, by his guidance, by his Quran, we know that, okay, this is the source, which is the economy, okay, which is that 1%. There is a system that we call it capitalism, gives the opportunity to that 1% of the world population to gain $110 trillion, and they want to become richer and richer. And they want to, you know, they make conflict here, there, they, just human trafficking is $150 billion a year, $150 billion a year. So that's what drive people to do this, you know, to do all these bad deeds. When farmers of Afghanistan, they can sell one kilo opium uh, for hundreds of dollars per kilo, but they cannot sell potatoes and tomatoes for even 10 cents. They, they might not even be able to sell it for 10 cents. So what drives them to produce opium instead of potatoes and tomatoes is the money, okay? So this, uh, uh, he showed us that this is the source and the solution he has uh, shown us in uh, Quran that we stand five times a day, we stand towards Mecca and say, eh, Muslim, show me the right way. And the right way he has shown us, but unfortunately people, they just, you know, they don't analyze it, okay? They just go, uh, uh, you know, to Mecca, and then they dress those dress of Ahram without understanding what does it mean, okay? It means equality. Why he didn't allow us to, to wear silk? He, he decided even the, the material of that, those two uh, uh, piece of uh, material. He said that it has to be cotton, okay? And it has to be white. You don't have to wear any jewelry. You are equal. Everybody are equal there. So this, the solution is that we are all equal and we uh, say to God, we accept it. And then we reject the, we reject the opposite of equality, which is, he told us, shaitan is the one who spread poverty among you. <clears throat> and that verse says also that the, the, the uh, weapon of Satan is poverty. <clears throat> shaitan spread poverty among you and then lead you to immorality. So without poverty, he cannot lead us to immorality. So <clears throat> his weapon is poverty and poverty is opposite to wealth. If wealth doesn't exist, then poverty will not exist. Uh, Ali Radio says 1400 years ago, nowhere on this planet, uh, a wealth gather, unless hundreds of people get poor opposite of it. I mean, uh, because of that wealth that gather, okay? So wealth and poverty, no wealth, no poverty, then will be equality. So these are, uh, uh, and then uh, another thing is that, um, uh, another uh, chapter of Quran says, uh, chapter 28, verse five, <clears throat> and we wanted to confer, co to confer favor upon those who were oppressed on earth and make them leaders and make them inheritors. <clears throat> In Quran, we have just two uh, uh, classes, <clears throat> oppressed and oppressor. So he says that he, he wants to favor those who are oppressed and make them inheritors and leaders. So when that oppressed, which is that 
hundreds of millions of people who are living on one dollar a day and the the leaders are now that one percent okay they decide about everything you know before was uh, those weapon cartels now is uh, facebook <laughs> and uh, you know this uh, uh, uh what is it um, facebook and then uh, twitter you know they even uh, control uh, u.s election you know <laughs> who is going to be president so right. Right. Um, yeah, this one percent are now leader, but he wanted that those hundreds of millions who are oppressed they lead the, the world, the planet. Okay, so if they become leaders, it doesn't mean that they become oppressor. Right. And then right. this one percent become oppressed. So that's is a false promise again because it's a circle of oppression and oppressed. Okay, so what does it mean? It means that the oppression will disappear. Is that we say Mahdi will come and get rid of all these problems? So uh, the, there's a hadith uh, says that Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him says that if only one day of the time remain, Allah would rise up a man from my family who would fill this earth with justice as it has been filled with oppression, okay? This mm -hmm. is Tonabu, Dawood book 36, number 4270, okay? <clears throat> so this is also a promise, but uh, there is a discussion, of course, about that if somebody will come or not, that's uh, another discussion, but there is a promise anyway, as I said from the beginning, these are all messages that there is a way out, but it doesn't mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to send a Superman to save us, no. We are going to do that. We that's the beauty of uh, his you know his creation that we will become so st smart so understanding that we can spread this message ourselves okay and uh, we can uh, we can spread this message ourselves and uh, we can uh, establish that his will allah's will okay we are going to do that we are going to submit to his will that yes we go to that uh, to Mecca and we go around the Mecca and say yes we accept it we say it okay and then we go and reject the opposite and then we go sacrifice for it so we have to sacrifice we have to say yes we will do that so we are I say always that we are Mahdi we are Messiah ourselves if we we save the humanity we can do that he's not going to if if he was going to send somebody he would send that uh, somebody I was talking to brother um, um, Tony, Tony Boomer. And, you know, I said, I don't know if you know him uh, from uh, this, consider this TV. I said that if he was going to send somebody, he would send uh, that person first world war, second world war, that the world was in such a chaos. The world is going towards better time. Okay. He said, no, I see that the world is going towards worse time. But I said, look, 100 years ago, millions of people would die of hunger in Africa, okay? Millions of people. Today, they don't die of hunger. Look at this Arab Spring. People are waking up. They want democracy. They want, uh, you know, development, okay? So and I see that, for example, Sweden was not like this 100 years ago, 200 years ago. Today is, uh, is not perfect, but Scandinavia is not perfect, but it's much, much better than 100, 200 years ago. And so we are going to a better time. Uh, in in um, <clears throat> Damascus, uh, sorry, in Syria, people are bombed now. Let's say in 10, 20 years, inshallah, they will get democracy, they will get rid of this dictatorship, okay? And they, he will, he, str he struggle, he try to keep, uh, stay in power and kill people, but one day people finally manage and get rid of him and they, uh, they build a uh, a better world for themselves, a better country for themselves. And then somebody fall from the sky and say, hey, I'm Mahdi, I've come to save you. People will tell him that, excuse me, now it's better time. Why you didn't come uh, in 2012, 13, 14, when he was uh, bombing us with, uh, uh, what is it, with uh, chemical weapons. Why you didn't come that time? Why you came now? So this doesn't make sense if we think about that, oh, somebody is going to come and save us, you know, a Superman. Uh, in well, that case, well, you well, in that regard, regard, I think what, I you're, what you're talking about is the allegorical versus the literal. Uh, the Quran says some verses are allegorical, some literal. Some do believe the Messiah is a literal character. The Mahdi is a 
person. Some believe it is, a, I know there's a rabbis who say mess, Messiah is just a, an era, the messianic era, it's not a person. Some believe it is. But either yeah. way, even if you did believe in the second coming of Jesus or you believe the Mahdi was coming from, it wouldn't mean that you don't do anything. It just means that they finalize a perfected kingdom because we can't really bring we can't really bring bring anything into perfection as Allah created the garden. So in other words, the hope of the 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 Messiah sitting on a throne or the Mahdi is the finalized kingdom after judgment day, after everything that brings that about. But it still wouldn't even if you did believe in a literal um you know, a second coming of Christ or a Bhakti, it still wouldn't give you an excuse to say, oh, I'm just sitting and waiting. I don't have to do it. Yeah. yeah. I just want to tell you that he says that in that, uh, uh, what is it? Hadith also says that if one day, uh, if if only one day of this time, I mean, this world is left. So Mahdi is supposed to come before the, uh, you know, end of the time. So it is exactly, uh, it's supposed to be when we are leaving. So it's not about uh, the judgment day and so on. It is about today. Well, it, leads, it leads to the judgment because the Mahdi, it's sort of like the events because they call it the, um, there's a pre-resurrection. As you know, like in the Shia theology, there's a pre-resurrection of certain characters who come up and they they play a role. And then the Messiah, kept, the Mahdi then meets the Messiah in Jerusalem. And then they, they kill the Dajjal. And there's a whole bunch of events, but eventually it does lead to, Judgment, but I'm saying there's a the end time, like, like, like for example, the prophet Muhammad, he's called the, the the seal of the prophets because he he's leading us to that judgment, even though he was 1400 years ago, it, he bought the final revelation. We've had before that, we had Moses, we had this, that. So, he's his the events that are triggering from him are leading us into the final. And remember, it says time. One day in our world, you know, it's it's it, it's a thousand a thousand years in our world is one day in the in the heavenly kingdom. So time is your is irrelevant. He's not God is not time bound. We may think it seems like some people say when the creation the world was created in six days, but then the Quran says six periods. It wasn't necessarily days. It could have been a thousand years for each day. So time is a elusive kind of thing. It doesn't necessarily correspond, but the idea of the Mahdi and the Messiah coming is supposedly leading us to that closure and the establishment of God's kingdom. But I understand what you're saying. There's, there is the, always the, the, the theological dispute between the literal and the metaphoric, the allegorical verses and the literal verses. Yeah, um, I want to to say as well that there is a verse of Quran says that <clears throat> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that I will not change any anybody's uh, destiny un unless they do it themselves. So so he wants us to do it ourselves, okay? So th that's why he, he's not going to send somebody. But, and I, I say that there are three ways that let's say tomorrow Mahdi will come, okay? There are three ways that he can solve our problems. If we are not going to do it, if the the, the the Superman is going to do it. I, I'm sorry, I say Superman is just because it is just an ordinary person. Then we can do it ourselves. We have the yeah. we have the book. We have the instruction. You know when uh, when have you been to IKEA and shopping? He uh, uh, IKEA give you the material and then uh, they give you the, the the map. Okay, and then you come home and do it yourself. Okay, so we have that everything we have in Quran. So if he's going to do it just like. Uh, from Quran, then so we can do it ourselves. He's going to read Quran for us or what? He's, he's not going to read Quran for us. He's supposed to, to change things. So is he, uh, how he's going to change things? That 1%, they have nuclear weapon, they have uh, all weapons, they, they, you know, they will fight, okay? So how is he going to do that? He's going to uh, change their weapons to, to, to sword or what, you know? So, uh, uh, I mean, uh, to kill everybody, so as long as this system exists, people will do that because they, farmers of Afghanistan, they need to put food on their table. That's why they, they go for opium, okay? So if Mahdi is going to, you know, establish uh, uh, something by force, then he has to 
and then we, we have this capitalist system that people can gain money, then they will go again for corruption, for, you know, for gathering money, you know, stealing, robbing each other, you know, and so on. And the farmers of Afghanistan, they will still go and uh, produce opium and so on. So if he's going to, uh, to force people to something, then he has to put food on their table by miracle or something, okay? And uh, people have to be just sitting home and doing nothing. Or another thing is that he take away our free will and we work live like uh, robots. Okay, he program us, say that, okay, do this. Farmers of Afghanistan just produce potatoes and tomatoes and they live without, you know, without understanding, which is against Allah SWT's uh, order. Free will should be there always. And <clears throat> that first one also, no compulsion in religion, no force, okay? It has to be with free will also. So both of them are out of the picture. The third one is to get rid of the source, which is the... As I said from beginning, if he has the cure, then the source must get, he has to get rid of the cancer, the source, which is shaitan. So if he get rid of the shaitan, then he doesn't need to do anything, you know, magic or special or force anybody because the source is gone. So when the source is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, the source is this economic system that um, threaten you or spread poverty among you and then lead you to immorality. So get rid of this system, which, uh, <clears throat> what is it? Let's share everything with each other, love one another, okay? Equal, <clears throat> even if you want to steal some something, you cannot because everything is free, brother. <clears throat> For example, you have a laptop or computer in your home, okay? If I can go and take it from the store for free, Am I going to come to your home and steal that laptop or, or computer or I don't know, your phone or whatever? No, I'm not going to do that. Why should I do that? It is isn't in the store. I can go and take it. But because I don't have money or I can sell that one, then I come. For example, <clears throat> I give you a better example. You have a diamond in your home. It's, it costs maybe $10 million. I, will, I would like to come and co take that diamond because it's $10 million. I would become very rich. But if that diamond cost zero dollar zero dollar would i come and steal that no it is just like a crystal like a store <clears throat> mm -hmm. has no value so what made it you know um, <clears throat> five million people die every year from cigarettes Fear from cigarettes five million people i've counted it is 33 nuclear bomb mm -hmm. hiroshima nuclear bomb 33 okay that kills five million people why because some uh, tobacco companies, they want to become richer and richer. I don't know, this, uh, uh, there are lots of people later, inshallah, I will, uh, I put now again, uh, place this link. If uh, later people would like to join us and talk and ask questions, there is a link uh, there, they can click and come. But um, anyway, I was saying that uh, that 5 million, they want to become richer and richer and they even target uh, uh, <clears throat> women. I, I saw a, a group of feminists, they were complaining to the United Nations that they have targeted women, that they say, if you smoke, you are you become slim and sexy. <laughs> so mm -hmm. they were complaining. So that's why they, if, if money doesn't exist, they will not produce a single uh, cigarette. Alcohol companies, they will not produce a single bottle of vodka or uh, what is it, or whiskey or whatever, if money doesn't exist so the solution easily is to get rid of this system that we share everything with each other <clears throat> i don't need to uh, when i uh, go to a grocery i don't need to for example i'm hungry my family is hungry i don't need to go and steal food i just go and take it and say assalamu uh, alaikum thank you brother god bless you without paying anything and i go home okay so uh, somebody was saying that um, the, um, the, there might be laziness, you know, people might not work and so on. No, that's when uh, we get reward. Okay, that comes from uh, education, okay? We, have, we will educate people that if you work, you get reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you do, that comes also again with, to do with the creator. We submit to him. He says that Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him said, working is a worship, okay? So if you work, you get reward. <coughs> That that's also working is a worship is not for today because today you get money. Worship you get you get what you get reward. But 
that worship he meant is that when you work, you get reward. It means that you get you work for free. Fi sabilallah, we call it. Okay. So otherwise, a, a person who's working in a uh, in a bar and serving alcohol to people is that worship? No. He get money. A person who's producing alcohol also work. He's getting. Uh, he, is that worship? No. So he meant what he meant was that. Working for free, Allah, okay, and get reward, not working for money. And uh, yes, well, I think uh, what, you're, you're, what you're discussing is sort of like a spiritual, a practical, practical spiritualism, and basically you're you're applying it in that way. Now, the different there there is a split over that in, in in theology. Right now, we have many churches that just see those actions, you know, as basically charitable actions, doing things, and they kind of remove, some of them even remove God literally. They'll just say God is just goodness and this, that, or God is love, and they, they try to take the identity. Now, for those that are literalists, their goal is saying that there was perfection. So no matter what we do, we, we can only perfect to a certain degree. We can, we can, we can make a big difference. We can stop those systems. But there's always going to be people who are devious. There's people that kill for no reason. There's people, there's always that. We're, so those that have hope in perfection, this is a theological point. And it should just. Answer, can I answer you, brother? Can I, brother, mm -hmm. answer you? That we have to think like this, that if the source of all bad deeds, according to Quran, is the Satan, okay, when we get rid of the source, that I told you that that's also a part of the pain of that cancer in your body. Okay, when you get rid of that cancer, all problem will disappear. All right. That's a good. That's a theology. Like I said, what you're presenting there is a theology that has a base to stand. Like I said, all you do is you say, yes, yeah, say money is the root of all evil, as it says in the Bible. Satan yes. is is the root of all evil. So money and Satan are equal. And when we get rid of money, we get rid of Satan. We get rid of Satan. We're back in. God's kingdom. So that's a, it's a it's a theology. But I'm saying as far as the literal, I was just trying to explain the literal sense. The literal sense is there was a first like like the first Adam who was deceived. That's where the trouble started. Then that's why we call Jesus the last Adam because Jesus is leading us back to the garden. Uh, for example, as the last Adam, the Quran says the likeness of Jesus is is as the likeness of Adam. Uh, he said, so be it, and he was. Uh, the Quran mentions the name of Jesus exactly 25 times. It mentions the name of Adam exactly 25 times. So there's a correlation between Jesus and Adam. The Bible says Jesus is the last Adam. And uh, where he was crucified, they say there was a garden. When he resurrected, the first one to see him was uh, Mary Magdalene, and she thought he was the gardener. Mm -hmm. And the place he was crucified was called Golgotha, the place of the skull. And the reason it was called the place of the skull was they believed Adam's skull was buried there. So the, the, the whole idea of waiting for a literal second coming of Jesus is to is that the set through the second Adam, right? The 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 the, the garden is restored. Janah meaning the garden, which is heaven, which is paradise, perfect yes. paradise. And what we're doing, they would say, like what you're doing is leading to that, but there has to be a finalization to bring the earth back into the perfect realm that it was. We can do away with a lot of things, yeah. but we can never establish on our own, we can't establish perfection. And the perfection comes, and I'm, I'm just I'm just trying to be objective here. I mean, I have my beliefs and I can explain yeah, that yeah, exactly. in a real sense, but I'm just trying to give you an overview of where people are coming from. But I don't think it. I don't think it distracts from what you want to do because I said, like, whether you think the whether you think the money is the money system is sane or you think it's satanic, it still comes down to the same thing. You have to go against it. Whether you think whether you think the Messiah and Mahdi are a character that comes at the end, it doesn't distract from the fact that you need to stand up and do what you need to do until that time comes. If it doesn't come, then it doesn't come. If it comes. Yes, then, yes, exactly. So it's not a, it's not really a distraction, but I'm just trying to um, to to just give you the overview of how people are viewing it when you get into the literal versus the allegorical. And then the last point I just want to I want to bring is just getting into one point of the overview of economics that I think in the 
we talked about this a little bit before in the in the Eastern world and in some poor countries, there's a very clear line between the rich and the poor. And that makes it a little easier to unify poor people if they have a if they have a, a leader, if they have a good leader. Yeah. And to revolt. They're ready to revolt because they have nothing and they have nothing to lose. Yes, yes. But but in the Western world, they've developed a very strong middle class. Yes. And middle class people, like in America, they're living in what would be considered wealthy and rich to other people. I mean, you can come from a poor, you can be a poor person in India that works for a dollar a day. You come to America, you do some hard work, you save some money, you open up a small business, an Indian restaurant, this, that. Before you know it, you're prospering, you invest a little money. And before you know it, you're living a middle class life. You've got a, a, a home down the shore. You've got a home in the city. You've got a boat. You're sending your kids to college. And that middle class is in the Western world. That's supposed to be the balance between the poor. And, and as long as there's a middle class, the middle class hopes to be rich because a middle class person always sees the light that, hey, I can become rich. If I, I have you know, now you have all different ideas because of the Internet. Hey, I can sell this. I can do that. I want to make a new. Uh, I have an idea for this, and there's so much exchange of ideas and things happening in the Western world. This is not happening in, for other people. For other people, they're just stuck. They're stuck in the mud. They can't do anything. But in the Western world, they feel like there's opportunity. So even the poor person in America, he sees that he can become middle class. There's a chance. There's a chance. And as long as they have that hope, they support the system. And they don't really, they do. I mean, now the middle class is coming under attack now. You hear more about that in the Western world, that they want to do away with the middle class. They want to push everything back. So there's just going to be the wealthy and there's going to be the poor. And that then the middle class starts getting angry. And the question is, where does the middle class go? Do they side with the poor or does the rich use them as a means to contain the poor? So they're caught, they're, they're kind of in, in, in the middle floating around. And that's more from the, in that, that's what's going on mostly in the Western world. There's, um, it's a little different outlook for people, and people are a little bit hesitant to go along with systems that abolish wealth because they say, "Hey, I, you know, I don't want to be caught under some socialist dictator somewhere, and you know, I don't want to. I'm not in the mud. I don't want to be. I don't want to just be a poor soldier for some Fidel Castro." dictator you know i want to live my good life that i'm living in america or i'm living in switzerland i want to be able to you know to do that so they because they see life differently but that life a lot of times is at the expense of other people you know a lot of things that these companies a lot of things that we're using are made by slave labor of children in other places and we don't see that but it's closing in and the last point i wanted to make is sort of like in the like for example in the western world the United States, which is in the Western world, has kind of isolated itself because it's surrounded by a whole host of Hispanic nations. There's like who knows how many of these nations there are, the whole South America, Central America. And they never took the time, even though Christianity says love thy neighbor, they never took the time to develop those places. And I, I mentioned to you before, we don't even know the names of the presidents of these places. And these are supposed to be you know, if I asked you right now, well, yeah, who, who's the president of Paraguay? Who's the president of Ecuador? Who's the president of Nicaragua? Well, you know, you might, if you're, if you're really learned, you might be able to pop those answers out. But most people don't know. The only ones we know are the ones that go against us. Then we know them. We know Fidel Castro. We know Chavez. We know Noriega after they turned the, we remember all those names, but we can't remember the ones who are supposed to be our allies because we don't care about them. And when we don't care about them, it causes that imbalance. So instead of opening up the Americas, now, now of course, on that conservative side, they'll say, well, you're talking about open borders. Well, guess what? You're living in a hemisphere where you've got 20, 30 nations that are surrounding you, okay? And you don't have good relations. That's why you did have missiles in Cuba. Why? I mean, it's so ridiculous that an enemy nation could come right to Cuba on Florida, next to Florida and be welcomed because you didn't take the opportunity to make that alliance. And when you did make the alliance, you, all you did was you created a system where you supported the wealthy and you had the poor. Because a lot of times the government here, even though they have democracy here, 
they don't really want democracy in these other places because when you have democracy, it takes too long to get things done. So you, you rather have a dictator in Egypt like Mubarak because it's easier if you want something done to call him on the phone and say, get it done. If he has to go through all the his Congress and filibusters and he has to talk and say, I'll get back to you. Wait till we decide. I have to I have to pass the bill through my Congress and then our Senate will debate with the House of Representatives. And then I'll come back to you maybe in, two, in three months and let you know if we're going to be siding with you. In the They don't want that. They want one man who can get the job done. So they so even though they have democracy, they're not promoting it in other places. So what you had in South America, when you have a when you have somebody that's aligned with us, it's usually a dictator or it's somebody who's disguised as being democratic. You have people like, for example, in, and, and I'm not saying some of these guys are good themselves. They may have good intentions. But like, for example, like in Uganda, the, 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 in Zimbabwe, you've had leaders that have been there for four years. And then supposedly they keep winning their elections, you know, and they keep winning for 40, 50 years. But in the end result is you do have some form of a dictatorship. Now, they, they would say, well, hey, he's better than what was before. Museveni is better than Idi Amin. This one's better than that one, you know, but they would rather because of the idea that you don't embrace these places, especially the ones that are in our own backyard. Yeah. You talk about Mexicans want to come across the border. Yeah, because you created this whole situation and now they're coming across the border. And now the middle class here is feeling threatened. Well, if we keep letting these people in, who's going to pay and who's going to pay? So that middle class is shrinking, as they say. But that's really the obstacle, I think, in thinking in the Western world. They're trying to hang on now. They want to hang on, and they're afraid that these masses are coming. They're coming here. They're coming there. What do we do now? Yeah, and but uh, I would like to say that if they, of course, they don't destroy other countries, then nobody will come to these countries. You know, like I'm myself, um, I moved from my home country. Four million Iranian have moved from uh, Iran, which is very, very rich country. You know. Uh, but 75% of people are on the poverty line now because uh, <clears throat> a dictator uh, regime is there and they kill people, you know, they destroy the country. They, mm -hmm. All money goes to uh, terrorism everywhere and so on. So, um, and who is who put this uh, regime in power was the West. USA and UK, they put uh, Ayatollah Khomeini in power because uh, after the revolution or during the revolution, we, uh, they were afraid of uh, leftist groups to take mm -hmm. the power. If they took the power, they would join Soviet Union. That's why they right, said, okay, right. Khomeini, Khomeini is better because he's a, a, an ISIS, a backward person. He, he will never join uh, Soviet Union because he's a religious person. And uh, if we don't get Iran, then Soviet Union doesn't get Iran either. So let he, he take the power. And he took the power and still they are supporting this dictator so that he destroyed the Middle East and then they sell their weapons to uh, Gulf countries, you know, and so on. So that's why people uh, from Iraq, from Iran, from Syria, they run away because of these, uh, you know, these dictators they created. And I see people are uh, online as well. I would like to ask uh, anybody who have any question, please join us. There is the link there. Uh, I would like to ask, uh, uh, I mean, get their question. I see brother Muhammad Abu Shawbi. Shaw uh, I hope that I uh, pronounce it well. Uh, I would like that he also um, come online and uh, ask us, uh, join us and ask us questions. So yes, uh, this, uh, I mean, I would, uh, I would like to come to live in this cold, uh, you know, climate when I, my home country is much better climate, uh, much better. Uh, I would like to, to live there, but because I don't know how much you are uh, familiar with uh, politics. Uh, in 1953, uh, we had a democratic elected uh, uh, prime minister, Dr. Mossadegh. They brought him down because he, uh, um, what is it, nationalized uh, uh, our oil by CIA and uh, UK. They, they brought him down and they provided us with a dictator. After 27 years, when we made a revolution against that dictator, what happened? Uh, they provided us with Ayatollah Khomeini. And, uh, until today, they are supporting uh, this government with different ways. For example, uh, 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 what is it? Uh, Trump. He put the maximum pressure on on these ayatollahs to uh, to bring them. He didn't want to bring bring them down. 
He just wanted to change their behavior, okay? Because they don't want democracy in, in Iran. Democracy in Iran will spread in uh, entire Middle East. So they want uh, uh, dictatorship, but under control. Well, that's what I was saying before. That's why I said they don't want, they want one person because when you want something done, you don't want to take weeks and months like it's here. Here you have a debate in the Senate. So if you can go right to Khomeini and, he, and he's got a one man, you know, solution, then whenever you want done, you just go to him and it's done. And he pays a certain amount of people that are surrounding him and he has that click and then it just snowballs a domino. So you, that's the only way you get things done. If you promote democracy, then every nation has its own will. And now you're, you can't control it. Yes, and then another thing is that all nations, they develop. When democracy is there, they develop, okay? So when they develop, they don't buy your, uh, your stuff, your gadgets. They will produce their own. So that's why, uh, you know, they think about this economy again. They're not sharing with each other, but uh, what is it? Controlling everything, or right? They don't want they don't want the other people to get that same appetite for yes. those things. And that, for example, I was seeing in Israel, reading about that they what they do is, I mean, first off, they got rid of the um, they, they expelled a lot of people when they came in. Then they yes. went and got the then they went and got the Arab Jews from the Arab countries, brought them in so they could become the new slave labor class. The working class and then after they stay there because they relied on them they need them as soldiers then they start to taste that life so that they want to so then they started to go into places like uh, the philippines to, to bring in these laborers to to start to replace them yeah. and then they then then what they did was after you stayed like six months if you were from yugoslavia the philippines wherever you're from they would send you out again because they wouldn't want you to get too comfortable and then they would bring in a new wave from Thailand or somewhere. And then they, those people try to, so it becomes like a, a, a revolving door. You know, they, they, they don't want, um, it goes back to the point you were saying, they don't want, because if you, have a, if you have a true democracy, then everybody gets, first off, they have their free will. So you can't impose what you want, you have to ask. And then secondly, the people get used to your lifestyle. They get used to those things themselves and then they don't need your thing. So that's less control. So, it, 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 but in the end, it, but it's something that's hard to see because the, the, the blinders are on, like I said, the middle class person who worked hard in the West, who yeah. studied to be an engineer, he studied to be a doctor, and he, he doesn't see that because when, as long as you don't see that child slave laborer somewhere, you don't think about it. Like it says, out of sight, out of mind. So he just feels, hey, I built this up, I earned this, I deserve this. I don't, but now all those things are coming at them. They're getting closer. We have the internet. People are, are, are just becoming more accessible to the Western world. And of course, through mass immigration. Yes. I just uh, <clears throat> wish that somebody uh, could uh, come online and ask us a question, but uh, we go back again to that, uh, uh, to uh, our topic uh, that, <clears throat> Yeah, the shaitan, uh, which is, uh, of course, uh, somebody uh, before uh, they were asking, telling me that, no, capitalism didn't exist for a long time ago. So people were doing bad anyway. And uh, I would like to uh, address that one as well. That uh, <clears throat> First of all, uh, this uh, capitalism means that uh, a system that allow you to, to gather capital. And this has been uh, in place since we came out of the caves and start to far, okay? We wanted more and more land, you know, we were occupying uh, each other's land and then uh, taking from each other their own, uh, you know, um, what is it, uh, wealth and so on. So, but anyway, there are three uh, different types of scenes, I, I, I can say. That one is uh, <clears throat> when you don't understand that it is a scene because of lack of knowledge. It doesn't have anything to do with the Satan. For example, chimpanzees, they, they also seem they do bad deeds, okay? Uh, and it has nothing to do with Satan, okay? Shaitan. Uh, they kill each other, they, they rape each other, and so on. But a human child, two years old human child, is equal, the, the intelligence of a human child, two years old, is equal to a chimpanzee. That two years old child might do something bad as well, okay? That's not a Shaitan. Okay, and then when it, that child grow, maybe ten years old, twelve years old, can even kill people. Okay, like 
there was a, a two girls they killed a, a, a uber driver a few weeks ago one of them was 13 yeah another one was 15 i don't know you heard that, that yeah i did hear it yes 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 so it me that doesn't mean that the shaitan fooled them it is lack of knowledge okay how they became like that that's also another story okay um because i say always that they were not born killers they were not born like that something that society that uh, system the family they were living if they were living in my family they would be totally different people okay so what drive them to that was another thing is lack of knowledge lack of understanding lack of good education that led them to that and then for example you become uh, even old for example uh, 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 somebody uh, you are born in in india okay in a remote village that hundreds of kilometers uh, around you everybody is hindu and when you are born your parents tell you that this statue is your God, okay? You have millions of God and so on. You don't hear about Islam or Christianity or other uh, beliefs. When you grow up, you continue to do that. That's lack of knowledge. That's not shaitan that fooled that person. It's lack of knowledge only. Or um, uh, <clears throat> before I become Muslim, um, I actually, I, I, um, I, I stopped to drink uh, alcohol when I uh, made my documentary movie. I made a documentary movie about alcohol and I realized that, oh my God, it is poison. It's so many uh, bad deeds in that. Before I was drinking, it wasn't because of shaitan, it was because I had lack of knowledge. When I got the right knowledge, I stopped it, okay? Mm -hmm. And then, uh, of course, after I became Muslims, uh, Muslim, I realized that, uh, of course, this is why it is haram, because it is pure poison. So, uh, but somebody who drink it like Christians who drink it uh, or they eat pork is lack of knowledge. It's not that shaitan fooled them. Another type of sin is that when you're forced to do that, for example, this human trafficking, you know, they force women to prostitution. And then like uh, I was saying uh, last time in my home country, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini, he would torture you, uh, political prisoners. He would torture you so long and so bad that you would give up everything. You were ready to kill your own friends. You give up your own friends and then you you were ready. They were doing, you know, they, some prisoners who were turning and torturing other prisoners. They were some pr prisoners, they were ready to cooperate with the regime only in one condition, that they get executed. They wanted to be executed because they couldn't take the torture anymore, okay? So this is, not shaitan, it is that shaitanic system that makes them to do this badly. The third one is shaitan, which I explained that <clears throat> that diamond, which is $10 million in your house, drive me to come and, you know, steal it. That's that system which gives value to that diamond or farmers of Afghanistan who produce that opium because it gives them more money, okay? That's shaitan. Uh, <clears throat> that uh, drive them. For example, this is the, 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 the one which I say is capitalism, okay? And it doesn't have anything to do with that uh, falling angel or jinn or whatever, okay? Mm -hmm. this, this is those two, I explained why uh, they, they happen is because of that doesn't have either with no, neither capitalism or that fa falling angel. The third one is with, because of capitalism. Now, let's say, <clears throat> Some people say, no, it is that falling angel or jinn, okay? So let's take away that falling angel, okay? Which I said that Quran says that one day his time is finished. Let's to, we just imagine that tomorrow shaitan doesn't exist, okay? It disappeared, gone. So as I said before as well, will farmers of Afghanistan stop? They wake up and destroy their, their uh, opium farm. No, they will not do that because as I said, again, they have to put food on their table. They think. That if I destroy it, how can I feed my children? They will continue. That 1% that own $110 trillion, will they stop to do that to gain more money? No, they will not. They want more and more because, it, because that's, that's, that money will drive them to that. Because, you know, uh, but if we, if, uh, if, we get rid of, if we get rid of that capitalist system and shaitan is still there, he cannot 
Shaitan, they say that it whispers in your ear. I have never heard anybody whisper in my ear. I don't know. <laughs> so if that, so he's hypnotizing me or somehow. That hypnotized or that angel tell me that, hey, there is a diamond in uh, Brother Isaac's home. It's $10 million. Go and take it. Or let's say that that diamond, I said that the capitalism is gone. But he said, there is a diamond there which costs zero dollar. Go and take it. I said, are you crazy? Why should I go do that? Because it's zero dollar. It's just a crystal. I can get it anywhere. Okay, it's a stone. So Shaitan will, that weapon that Allah SWT said, his weapon is poverty, will, we will get, take away his weapon. His weapon is gone. Then we, he cannot fool that farmers of Afghanistan, those farmers of Afghanistan. Hey, if you produce opium, you can sell it hundreds of dollars because they cannot sell it. Hey, if you produce a, a cigarette, you can kill 5 million people and you can become billionaire, okay? That will disappear. They will say, excuse me, are you crazy? I'm, why should I produce a cigarette and kill people when I cannot sell it? Nobody will go to that business anymore. Nobody right. go to human trafficking anymore. It will stop totally. Will people stay home and do nothing? No, it is not like that. This is, we, we cannot go there in one day. No, absolutely not. It might take hundreds of years, a thousand years. We have to go there slowly, slowly. We have to make everybody to accept it. Like we go there to Mecca and say, I accept it, okay? I accept it. We have, everybody must accept it. And then we have to, you know, sacrifice for that. That sacrifice we make that uh, sheep is that, that I work, I do whatever I can. I work hard to, to make this, uh, this uh, equality to happen. Okay. And I reject that inequality. All right. So this is uh, um, what, uh, uh, I would like to uh, everybody understand that uh, that if we get rid of this system, inshallah, we have to spread this, that this system is the devil and we have to get rid of this system and everything will be uh, fixed, everything, inshallah. Because now, that, there, just to wrap up and to give you one last, just a quick question and answer so we can wrap up. Yes, yes. Remember, I remember last lecture, somebody asked you, is there a group? Is there something that, I mean, like, in other words, you have the ideology now, what you did, you you presented a, the, a certain type of theology that's not based on literal literalism. And of course, that's in the allegorical versus the literal. And then you, you've you given somewhat of a, a blueprint okay. saying, you know, if this happens, a, the, a, a theory, a thesis, if this happens, then this will happen. If economics is, but I'm saying, is there, do you have, do you represent, is there a group? Is there a community? And you mentioned to that, to the lady, there was some group that's doing something. Is there something that people can read about or, or, or yeah. join? Is there something specific or is this just a general ideology that you want to disseminate? Uh, uh, yes, uh, actually uh, I follow myself uh, an organization that uh, we are fighting the Iranian regime and uh, we have been fighting a previous regime as well now. It's uh, 57 years that the organization has been established by three students, Muslim students. And they, they came to this uh, uh, idea that uh, the, the fight is not between believers and non-believers. The fight is between oppressors and oppressed, okay? So in that fight, everybody can uh, you know, join in that fight. Okay. What's the name of the organization? The organization called is People People Mujahideen Organization of Iran. Okay, or Mujahideen Khal or MEK. They are also called MEK. Okay. And this organization uh, also believe in equality. Okay, uh, they believe that um, you know that one. Well, they day must be doing. They must be doing fairly well because I had a. Um... There's an Iranian friend that I got, and I know he's he's very strong for the Shah. Okay, he, he comes from the Shah background, and um, right. he's saying one thing. He and he he he's worried. He's saying that the if if the regime is overthrown, it's probably not going to go to the. It's probably the, he's worried about this MEK. Okay, he's, wor he's worried that that they're they're going to take the. Um, you know, so I guess I guess he sees them as a the next 
viable uh, movement or the or I guess are they are they looked at as the uh, most prominent opposition to the government now? It is the only uh, alternative, the biggest opposition, because um, because the, as I uh, we were talking about that uh, they sacrifice. Okay, they have sacrificed everything. <clears throat> they they work um, almost twenty four hours. They have left everything, family, everything, and they are joined this organization, uh, fighting. They have been um, over hundred thousands of uh, their followers and members have been killed by Iranian regime. Okay, now they are, unfortunately, uh, USA and UK, they were in uh, Iraq, they had a city there, that community you were asking, they had that community. For example, uh, I know um, there were there were some uh, soldiers, okay, uh, Iranian soldiers who were captured by them and they were treating them according to Islam, tre treating them beautiful, well, after a few months, giving them best treatment, they were releasing them, saying that, okay, you want to go home or you can stay with us and fight with us. So some were leaving and going home, some stayed with them. And I met one of them, he was here, he said that I went to, to the store and I saw that everything was free there. So I went and took uh, three pair of socks, okay? Sorry, uh, yes, three pair of socks. And then I came home, uh, sorry, I, uh, not home, but in their room or whatever. And then I started to think my, by myself that why I took three? It is there, I can go and take it tomorrow as well. I went and put back two, I kept just one, okay? So that community existed, but when in 2003, when USA and UK occupied Iraq, Iranian regime asked them, this is one of those facts that I was telling you that they are supporting this regime, despite they are talking against each other, they fight, but they're supporting each other. What happened, USA and UK bombed MEK because Iranian regime asked them to bomb MEK. They bombed MEK, destroyed their bases, killed 50 of their members, and they tried to destroy them anyway. They couldn't destroy them totally. So they are moved now to, to, to Albania. Now they have that community in Albania near Tirana, and they are still fighting Iranian regime, unfortunately now because of uh, the West, they don't want to bring down this regime. They are fighting through internet. Okay. Are there any outside governments that are supporting them, or any? any I mean, you say United no. States, the West, any other? Yeah. Any? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, no government supporting them because of their 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 interest. Because if they support them, then they will uh, have problem with the Iranian regime. Okay. But they have indirect support, like Albania allowed them to to stay there and say that they are guests. They are. They are very welcome. And then, but there are many, many politicians who support them, like even John McCain. He flied from Washington despite he was sick, you know, before he, uh, one year before he died. He flied from uh, Washington all the way to Albania to meet them and give his support. Many, many uh, politicians from, uh, what is it, USA, from Europe support. Uh, in 2018, for example, we had a meeting in Paris, okay, and um, many politicians were there, even uh, Rudy Giuliani was there, you know, um, many uh, parliamentarians. And one Iranian uh, diplomat, <clears throat> uh, together with three, uh, uh, you know, he's, uh, um, what is it, he's terrorist, you know. They were going to blow up uh, our, our meeting. So 100,000 people were there, okay. And uh, they were caught before, before the attack. So uh, and now the 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 the, the this uh, diplomat he he got after two years trail he got twenty years in jail those others also seventeen eighteen so on they got they got uh, uh, jail in they are in in uh, uh, what is it in um, Belgium in Belgium they they are in jail now okay so uh, that uh, guy who is uh, for Shah when you you know. He's understanding you. You just have to understand this much that when somebody support a dictator, previous dictator who was cause of this the revolution and then uh, this Khomeini got the power, all was because of Shah's uh, you know fault. If he gave us democracy, if he was a democratic king, then we would never make a revolution against him. Like Sweden, we have a king who has no power. It sounds like M E K. It sounds like it's sort of a balance because you have like 
the Shah, then you have the monarchy, and then you had this religious kind of fanaticism. And then the MEK seems to combine somewhat of a religious theology, not necessarily a literal theology, with modern with the modern application. So maybe it's a balance, you know, a balance that will attract. Because sometimes when you shift too hard, you know, from no religion, religion, no religion. So it's kind of like maybe it will attract more people because it has some religious elements to it, but it also has, you know, a path for the people. It's, it's a people's movement. Yeah, it's, uh, it's like this. That <clears throat> I better put it in this way that <clears throat> they are the biggest enemy of these dictators, okay? So these, these dictators, they make a lot of propaganda against MEK. <clears throat> they make movies, you know, a lot of propaganda, billions of dollars on propaganda against MEK. <clears throat> it's not only that. It's not only Iranian regime, even Western countries, like uh, we have this uh, BBC, for example, BBC Persia. We have, uh, uh, what is it, Voice of America, Persian, okay? And they are also full of Iranian agents inside those, <clears throat> those uh, you know, BBC and Voice of America who, <clears throat> uh, uh, you know, make propaganda against uh, MEK. So that's why some people like this, uh, your friend, you, you said, when he cannot analyze that, how can I be supporting a Shah who was dictator, okay, who was killing people, no freedom, uh, somebody who cannot even analyze this, how can he analyze that this MEK is a democratic uh, organization? I tell you that they are a Muslim organization, but they have support but in uh, Christians, Jews, Marxists, everybody. There are lots of people who right. sacrifice their lives for, for this MEK's cows because they see that they are. I, I read a, a post, some um, a comment somebody uh, had put. He said that I don't believe in any religion, but what MEK does, I love it because they sacrifice everything they have for for uh, people of Iran to to become free. <clears throat> anyway, that uh, uh, the talk was about that this community exists, okay, and um, they are living in. There are several thousand, but it, it can be on an entire planet when several thousand people can practice it, okay? Not only, um, you know, in a beautiful time, but in a time that they are bombed, they are killed, they are pushed, you know? Despite that, they don't give up because they found something beautiful and they want to continue. So imagine that in that world that there is no killing, there is no, you know, oppression, nothing. Everything is fine. So people would accept it and they would love it. Okay. Let me just ask you quickly and then we can wrap up on this one quick note because I, uh, from these other Iranians I was talking about, and I said he's, he, he's a Shah backer because I guess his family was probably prominent with the Shah. Yes. And he, he, he left Islam altogether and he claims that... Sorry, I'm sorry I dropped you, brother. I just yeah. sorry I stopped you that they I as I I also was born in Muslim family I became atheist when I was twenty five okay I started to think so he didn't leave Islam okay no 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 he he he's very vocal to say I'm not a Muslim he says I yeah, I, know, I hate I no no I know, just well, my question was the question no, I was to bring you his I just, prediction I just his I just want, sorry brother I just want to uh, make this one clear. When he said that I left Islam, I want to say that he never was a Muslim. He was just born in a Muslim family, okay? Like okay, I was okay. born in a Muslim family, no, 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 no. and at 25, I became atheist. I wasn't Muslim. I didn't understand Islam. But now I'm Muslim because I accepted it. Right. But what do, you, what do you think about his predict? He's predicting that, what, that he's saying that most Iranians are going to leave Islam altogether. He's saying most Iranians don't want Islam. He says they're going to other things. Is that is he over is he over exaggerating or is that true that like if the if the regime is gone will they just depart? He's saying Iran will will eventually be a non-Muslim country and will just it's going to leave altogether. No, it's uh, like this that of course a lot of people like him, okay, because they have lack of knowledge. They cannot, you know, they cannot understand that what Iranian regime does has nothing to do with with Islam because they never read, you know. Uh, Quran or they never understood it okay so that's why this Iranian regime which is a mafia regime and um, it is also uh, a sign that uh, 
that shaitan is this uh, economic system that they kill people not because of islam because they are uh, they are mafia they they just rob people okay the the leader of iran he was he didn't he was a poor man he didn't have a flat he, he was renting flat now he's 200 billion dollars rich so mm -hmm. these people cannot analyze it so there are yes many millions of people who say that no i'm not muslim they are islamophobic even they hate islam okay <clears throat> but when if inshallah this mk take the power then they will change because they see oh okay then this this is totally different okay for example in, in um, this regime doesn't um, what is it uh, discriminate women but mk gives absolute equal right to women women are leaders in mk so uh, there was a uh, uh, politician from from jordan met uh, our leader mrs mariam rajavi she met her and said that uh, when you take the power in iran it's not just iranian women who get their 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 rights all women in the middle east they will stand up for their rights because they say oh look that's islam also how come they are leaders but we cannot become leaders what or we cannot even drive uh, cars you know mm. how, they 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 can drive tanks, women who drive tanks, okay? They were doing that. Unfortunately, uh, USA and UK, they destroyed that, that it was a liberation army. Women who were driving helicopters, you know, and then driving tanks, and they were, they were leaders of men in, in, in the military, <clears throat> okay? Muslims, women, all right, with hijab. So that's why uh, uh, when they see that, they realize, as I said, that uh, also that atheist who wrote that I don't believe in any religion. But if they, uh, you know, when I see this MEK, they uh, they sacrifice everything. <clears throat> I love, you know. Somehow he was saying that if Islam is this, then it's beautiful. Okay. I actually I have to say my brother also. He was Islamophobic because of a, re uh, a reason. He hated Islam. Okay, and. Um, but anyway, he's he's supporting MEK. He was four and a half years in jail for MEK. Okay, despite his uh, his uh, he was Islamophobic. But and now, uh, ten years ago, he, he moved to Sweden. He's much more better because he he's working close with MEK, and he realized that okay, now this is different. Okay, their Islam is different with what was in in Iran. Okay. So this is the, uh, I also uh, say many times that uh, <clears throat> this Islamophobic that exists now in the world is partly because of Muslim world. Because when, when we, so, so many Muslims, they uh, represent a barbaric bar bar uh, religion, okay? Then they, they see, you know, they see that as, uh, oh yeah, it is, I mean, if Islam is what so many, uh, um, I have many discussion with them. Uh, I have uh, in my on my YouTube channel. I have the debate with uh, scholars. <clears throat> if Islam is that what they uh, present, even I am the biggest enemy of that Islam. I have been fighting forty two years against Iranian regime and their uh, you know ideology with uh, stoning uh, people, you know, uh, killing apostate and so on. So this is. Uh, what we have to clear between in our religion that these are these things have nothing to do is these are man-made rules these are these are not Allah's rules Allah is the most merciful and forgiving God okay Allah if we understand uh, Islam we, we see that we cannot even kill uh, a murderer mass murderer Abu Sufyan was the biggest enemy of Islam, okay? When uh, Prophet Muhammad uh, conquered Mecca, he forgave Abu Sufyan, who, if Abu Sufyan was caught in Sweden today, he would be uh, in, in prison for life, okay? We don't have execution here, but he would be in, uh, in, in prison for life. And his wife, Hind, who killed uh, Prophet's uh, uncle, was also, and all Mecca residents, they were all forgiven. Okay, despite they had killed Muslims before. If they and were the irony is his, his son, his son then became a caliph. Abu Abu's son, he later became the caliph after I mean in, in opposition to after um Muawiyah. 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 Yeah. Muawiyah, yeah. 
he was right. also he, he was also uh, yes he was also uh, like he, like his father okay uh, munafiq because he fought against uh, uh, ali radiallahu the fourth khalifa right. uh, and his son yazid who killed the grandson of uh, prophet peace be upon him so anyway prophet muhammad peace be upon him forgave them okay for even uh, some of his companions were former uh, you know killers who had killed uh, other companions but when they right. converted to islam they were forgiven so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave uh, this opportunity to everybody to repent okay and that opportunity is there as long as you are alive and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you the time okay so this killing you know somebody who had sex or uh, in that brutal barbaric way even okay or somebody who left islam or because as as i said like i was 25 i according to them i was apostate but i didn't understand so if you killed me i wouldn't have this opportunity to repent and you know do dawah so this shows that even quran says clearly that like craft with no compulsion in religion <clears throat> he says allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that those who were muslim and then left islam and then became muslim and then again left islam and then again become if their their judgment was uh, death then they wouldn't become muslim again after they left islam they, they wouldn't have been an opportunity to become muslim again right, so right. It, it shows itself that there is no such a law at all so that's why we have to to get rid of this islamophobia we have to uh, and clear our religion from these man-made laws okay and show the world that no islam is a religion of peace islam is a, a religion of mercy you know these these things that you see has nothing to do with islam this terrorism uh, if you anybody who has uh, google can google islamic terrorist uh, or terrorism history you cannot find a single terrorist attack before 1979. Before 1979, just Google it. There is no, the first one was nine, after a few months in Saudi Arabia, after a few months Iranian revolution. Why? Because when Khomeini took the power, he had the money and he couldn't build the country. So he spread terrorism outside. He spread war outside because through that he could oppress the opposition. He started a useless war, eight years useless war with Iraq. Then he uh, <clears throat> he built uh, or I mean organized, uh, created this this bullah in in Lebanon, and uh, uh, so you just go and check all terrorist actions made by so-called Muslims. All of them are after 1979. So this is also we see that it is politic it is not religion it wasn't in islam so it was created by a satanic regime who, that took the power in iran and, and has been spreading this uh, this uh, what is it this terrorism around the world and unfortunately western countries also they they lie that they want to fight terrorism okay uh, because they they benefit this terrorism themselves by supporting the the Godfather of international terrorism, the central bank of international terrorism, which is uh, which is Iranian regime. They now the, this Joe Biden is trying to you know to save this regime and give them billions of dollars, which was cut by uh, Donald Trump. Okay, where all this money goes? Only Obama gave them over hundred billion dollars. Obama gave them over hundred billion dollars. Where all this money went? not even one dollar to Iranian people, all went to Syria to killing people, to all terrorist, uh, you know, organization. For the first time after, you know, after all these years, during uh, Trump, Hezbollah was begging his supporters. Otherwise, until that, Hezbollah was getting $700 million a year from Iranian regime. $700 million a year were, was their budget, getting from Iranian regime. Just because of these sanctions, they didn't have money to pay to Hezbollah, okay? Mm -hmm. So they were starting to get in, to begging from their own supporters. So that's uh, um, uh, uh, another uh, example that um, unfortunately this, uh, what is it, Islamophobic uh, problem is coming because of, and I have been trying to discuss my fellow Muslim, many of them, they just, you know, just would like to talk about Jesus was God or son of God, or he was a prophet of God. I said, what it, and you know, it doesn't solve our problems. Our problems is 
We have to solve our problems. It doesn't matter that he was son of God or he was a prophet of God. We have to see, uh, in reality, we have to talk to Christians to find our common, uh, common interest, okay? All right, what we have problems, problems is poverty, prostitution, drugs. What is Christianity's uh, solution? What is Islam's solution? Let's talk about this, not that he was son of God or he was uh, uh, crucified or he wasn't crucified. This has been going on hundreds of years, hundreds of years, and it will go on hundreds of years. And it doesn't uh, solve poverty. It doesn't solve prostitution or drugs or anything, okay? So what it solves is that we sit together and talk, what is your solution? What is my solution? Let's talk about that, okay? Yes, brother. Any question if you have, uh, I would like that somebody comes and uh, ask us question, but unfortunately <laughs> nobody uh, come online and ask questions. Well, maybe if any posted, you will uh, You'll get you'll get the questions that we can come back to later. Inshallah. Well, I think we're already an hour and forty minutes, so we've really yeah yeah over. But uh, it was interesting information. It was good information about Iran and some things that people probably didn't know. Yes. And um, I guess we should just uh, bring this to a close out. Inshallah. Okay. All right, thank you very much, uh, brother. We can uh, do this, inshallah, later, and uh, maybe people would like to ask questions, let them watch it, inshallah, and then <clears throat> we will have another uh, discussion later, inshallah, okay? Right, okay. Salaam alaikum. Thank you, brother. Salaam alaikum. Thank you. Have a nice day. Have a nice day. Salaam alaikum. Right. Bye-bye. So